Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. Michael Pento. Michael is the president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. He produces and hosts his own podcast, The Midweek Reality Check. He is also the author of The Coming bond market collapse. He is a financial analyst and an investment advisor. He is an expert in these markets, and we are thrilled to be welcoming him back to the show today for his straightforward take on what is going on around the world right now. Michael, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm thrilled to be with you, Michelle. Thanks for having me back on. We are absolutely excited for this show. And Mike, we want to start with the Fed. What do you think of the recent 60 Minutes interview? We'll start with this, that Neil Kashkari from the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, he quoted the Fed as having an infinite amount of cash. Still, this took place just a couple of weeks ago. He went on to say there will never be a shortage of liquidity from the Fed, and it will act as aggressively as possible. What is going on, and what do you believe that the Fed should be doing right now? Oh, okay, so it's a lot, lot to unpack. So let's take it one step at a time. The whole picture, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Good question from you, Michelle. <laughs> so I always harken back to something I read maybe 15 years ago from uh, Richard Fisher, Fisher, who was the head of the Dallas Fed. And he was talking about hyperinflations and the difference between hyperinflations like, you know, the Hungarian Pengo and, you know, Weimar Germany and Zimbabwe and why that will never happen here in the United States. And to some, to some extent, I believe he's correct because, you know, all central banks are doing the same thing. They're just burning their currencies you know, from both ends. So perhaps we won't get the million percent hyperinflation. But Mr. Fisher said that the reason why we'll never have really even a problem with intractable inflation is because the central bank will never monetize. In other words, print money and buy the sovereign debt of the United States. Never do it. And, you know, I, I kind of like remember, uh, you know, I was maybe a little bit more naive back then. I said, oh, gee, that makes me feel a little better. You know, that I'll never buy uh, treasuries, especially longer duration treasuries, coupons. And you think about the Charter of the Federal Reserve, 1913, their mandate by Congress was to provide a discount window to primary dealers. In other words, if a bank was in trouble, they could take short-term treasuries to the discount window, exchange them at a penalty rate, okay, a steep discount, and this way they can tinker around the edges of, the, of money markets and of the Fed funds rate. That was the charter of the Federal Reserve. But now we see that the, the promise from Mr. Fisher, who I respect, I, I mean, I'm sure he was very uh, generous when he made the comments. We see the Federal Reserve who took the balance sheet from $800 billion to four and a half trillion during the great recession of 2008 to June of 2009, took the balance sheet to four and a half trillion and then started to unwind that balance sheet as promised, right? They started to do quantitative tightening and then they ran, to, ran into a cement wall in the fall of 2018. And then we had the repo crisis in, in uh, July and August of 2019. So the Fed went back into QE, remember? They started to cut rates again on the way towards zero before anyone ever heard of the Wuhan virus, okay? The Fed's balance sheet went from four and a half trillion down to around 3.8 trillion. And now, Michelle Holliday, it is well above $6 trillion and rising inexorably from there. So we have, we know two things now. We know that the Fed, has purchased and is continuing to purchase trillions of dollars of sovereign debt. And we also know that the Fed can never unwind its balance sheet. In other words, this debt has been permanently monetized. It will never leave the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. So the, 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 the assets remain on the Fed's balance sheet and the dollars remain in the economy as part of the base money supply, which is the rocket fuel for, for inflation. I just want to add one more thing before I let, let another question come in. What's different this time than at any other time in history is the Fed is not limiting itself to asset-backed securities, mortgage-backed securities, sovereign debt, municipal debt. Uh, we are now making primary loans to businesses. 
has never happened before, okay? We are buying corporate bond ETFs, never happened before. And Michelle, we learned last week that the Fed is now buying junk bonds. So the Fed is buying everything literally everything and making loans. So forget about just buying short-term treasuries like they used to do, the original, original charter in 1913. The Fed is buying everything except one thing, stocks. And I would not rule that out either. What do you see on the other side of this, uh, meaning the coronavirus situation? Number one, do you think it was the one and only trigger for our financial collapse, or do you think there could be another trigger right around the corner? Um, I wanna get your outlook for the foreseeable future, maybe six months from now to one year from now. What do you see? So we were in a epic bubble, which was searching for a pin prior to the crisis of the virus. So we had uh, one of my favorite metrics is total market cap of GDP was one and a half times, over one and a half times the underlying economy. That has never happened before, even higher than it was in March of 2000. So stocks were massively overvalued. Of course, you look at, at one point, we had $17 trillion of negative yielding debt around the globe. Talk about the, the building of the most massive and most dangerous bubble that has ever been conceived by central planners, which is the global bond bubble. Uh, that actually started to explode or implode, depending on your point of view. Um, with the pin of the virus. So he's had junk bonds run uh, 10 percentage points above treasury. So you know, the entire junk bond was once again shut down. Junk bond market was shut down. So uh, I, I guess what you're asking is, well, what's, what happens next from here? And that all depends on the virus. And I was thinking on the way into this interview about where we're headed in the short term. And we have a tremendous amount of optimism now in the stock market. And by the way, I run a long short portfolio, and so you know, I you know, I sometimes I'm short the market, sometimes I'm, I don't have any shorts at all. I had no shorts at all coming into the last few days. I closed them all out, especially when I learned that the Fed was going to buy junk bonds. <laughs> so there isn't any you know, the, the Fed is eviscerating capitalism, and not just the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, People's Bank of China, all the central banks are eviscerating any vestiges of capitalism left. There's no price discovery at all. It's all about central banks. So, so we have a lot of optimism in the market, and I'm thinking about ratios, and I'm saying to myself, well, what right now is the total market cap of equities to GDP? And I'm thinking about the, the numerator we, we can know. We, we know the numerator, but we don't know the denominator. What is, Michelle, what is GDP right now? And when is it gonna get better? So some estimates say, you know, there's gonna be a, a very sharp depression, short term, then we'll bounce back in a B. I think the B is gonna be Viagra, as I like to put it. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I don't believe the economy is going to fully reopen until there is a vaccine or a cure or the virus dissipates complete, almost completely. That's when people will start going to restaurants and hospital um, uh, hotels, flying on airplanes, going to entertainment outlets. That's when they'll start really opening up the economy. And until there's one of those three things happens, it's going to be a muted opening up of the economy. And right now the market's pricing in perfection to, uh, or, or for a light switch to go on, on May 1st. And that light switch is gonna be very, very dim, unfortunately, in my opinion. And if that's the case, then I think the market's exuberance is gonna be completely unfounded. So right now it's, you know, hey, the Fed's buying everything, the virus is dissipating, and we're about to open up the economy. After the economy opens back up, uh, albeit partially, I think there's going to be a massive disappointment because it'll be, as I said, partially opened up. And then you have the realization that there's a critical mass that's uh, incumbent on all of these businesses I just mentioned, hotels and airlines and restaurants. They can't just open up partially and then become solvent. So, you know, you think about a restaurant, if a restaurant doesn't have 70, 80% capacity, then they can't make any money. And if they can't fill that res restaurant regularly, consistently at that capacity, they close down and they lay off their employees permanently, which means all of the grants that they were issued become then loans. 
And who's on the hook for those loans? Are, is, it, is it the Wells Fargo's and JP Morgan's of the world? Or is it the government? Somebody's balance sheet is destroyed, is going to be destroyed, guaranteed. And whose balance sheet is it? Is it the taxpayer's balance sheet? So all of these issues remain, but right now I sense a lot of optimism, and I think that optimism is going to dissipate much faster than the virus does. So you think it's a false optimism because there is a lot of optimism. There's a lot of talk of um, infrastructure coming back to the United States because of um, basically loss in faith of China's outsourcing, not just to the United States, but around the world. What do you think in terms of that? Do you think that we're going to bring back jobs, um, sometimes in the tens of thousands? Um, that's the kind of optimism that we're hearing. What are your thoughts, Mike? Well, I mean, if let's suppose we do employ tens of thousands of people. We lost in three weeks, 17, 16.8 to be exact. So almost 17 million jobs, Michelle, in the last three weeks. So we can't just bring back tens of thousands of people. We need to bring back millions upon millions of people. And uh, the idea that you're going to pass this uh, infrastructure bill, I mean, maybe they will, maybe they won't. Phase four, phase, phase five of the stimulus, I, I lost track. But who, where is this money going to come from? Well, the answer is it's all going to be printed. Like I said, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is now $6 trillion on its way to $10 trillion by the end of this year. And, you know, if you think of Newton's law, the third law of motion, for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, what is the consequences? What are the consequences of issuing trillions upon trillions of new debt upon an already debt burdened economy globally. And then what are the implications of monetizing or printing all of this money? Well, I mean, isn't there going to be some kind of inflationary or stagflationary consequence of all this money printing? I mean, can we just, can we just believe in magic and fairy tales and free lunches forever? Well, uh, here's the problem. Here's what I say. The Fed promised and not only, I don't want to pick on the Fed because it's not a, this is not just a dollar crisis. This is a euro crisis. This is a pound crisis. This is a renminbi crisis. Uh, this is a yen crisis. So the problem is that these central bankers all promised that their massive increase in balance sheets was temporary. Well, that was proven to be false even before the Wuhan outbreak. So now we, ha we have a threshold here. And I don't know what number, I, I really don't know what number it is, but we, we don't know what it, exact number, but we know it's six trillion is the threat is is the current level of the Fed's balance sheet. But what if it goes to eight, nine, ten trillion and is rising from there and the, the governments have to keep on stimulating and, and borrowing because the restaurants and the hotels and the airlines and the entertainment outlets are 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 going out of business and they're trying to keep their employees, you know semi semi attached to the to the workforce um, what happens to the faith in fiat currencies if they continue to uh, eviscerate them at this level I, I mean there might there is going to be a breaking point I don't know what it is but the breaking point is gonna be like hey you know what I'm just gonna I'm gonna simply raise my prices because the value of your fiat confetti that you are destroying at a record pace is losing its value and I'm just not going to accept the same value for my efforts as what you're presenting in, in paper currency. That, that, that threshold is out there. I don't know what it is, but could be, uh, as in your words of your favorite president, uh, uh, quickly. We've been talking about on our show, Venezuela, for a while. And last time you were on the show, we actually talked about this. Um, do you think that we could possibly? I mean, it makes me stutter, <laughs> headed in that direction. Um, I think it makes anybody stutter who realizes what Venezuela has gone through. People with no food, no money, yeah. no. And there are folks, there are people that are fortunate. They will have jobs. They, you know, they do have gold and silver and stuff, but that is not reflective of our mass population. So a couple of thoughts. First of all, um, the, the gap between the wealthy and the poor, which was already a, a, a trenchant, yawning gap heading into this crisis, is going to be much worse. So 40% of the, of the population has some sort of stocks in their portfolio. 
um, the other 60% of the population is seeing what? They're, 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 they're on food stamps, they're on welfare, they don't have a job, they're getting this stimulus from the government, um, but their portfolio isn't going up because they don't have one. And then you look at the stock market, which is incredibly up. I think we had the best week in decades, Easter week was the best week in the stock market in decades, even though that was the same week we learned that we lost almost 17 million people became unemployed. Talk about a dichotomy. So the rich are gonna get richer, people, banks are getting bailed out, uh, uh, you know, uh, the shadow banking system is getting bad, bailed out, pension plans are getting bailed out, which is, you know, you might say, well, that, what's wrong with that, Michael? Well, that, that's wonderful. But, you know, the problem is that we headed into this crisis in the United States with $23.5 trillion in debt, over 100% of GDP. That was what I was railing against, you know, since 2009, I said, you know, I, I actually went bullish in January of 2009. I was on TV twice a week for years, predicting the crisis, and then after the crisis, you know, well, the recession, the market bottomed in March of 09, and I went bullish on the Cudlow program on, in January of 09, uh, and I was derided, <laughs> for going bullish at that time, even though I was derided the whole time, warning people about the crisis. Um, but the thing is that, you know, we have, we're going into this crisis already, in many cases in this world, in an insolvent condition. I mean, totally, look at the, the, the uh, ratio of corporate debt as a percentage of the economy. An all-time record high, close to 50%. That was before the crisis. Now the denominator has gone way down. And... All these corporations have piled on, they've all tapped their revolving lines of credit. They've piled on more and more debt, and now they're issuing investment grade debt and, and junk bond debt, just to try to keep the doors open. So we just, you know, greatly accelerated and pushed the fast forward button on the next crisis, which I call the real crisis, which is gonna come, which is an inflationary and insolvency implosion of the bond market. That's what I wrote about in 2012. And when I wrote the book in 2012, the, the start of 2013 was published, I never dreamed, Michelle, for a moment that we would have trillions upon trillions of dollars of negative yielding debt. But you're, you're pushing more and more debt onto the world. You're pushing down the yields further and further. And then you're adding the, 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 the oxygen and the nitroglycerin to the, to the recipe there, which is inflation. And you can have this whole thing incinerate very quickly, and then you're gonna to look to the government for a bailout, and you're not gonna find one because when you have inflation running intractable, yields starting to soar, prices plunging on all kinds of fixed income assets because of the inflation that the central banks have so desperately wanted. Um, and you have an insolvency concern as well, you can't mitigate or placate or mollify that by coming to the you know, Main Street financial media and saying, we're going to raise more debt and we're going to print it all? That doesn't solve the cause. That, that exacerbates the insolvency and inflationary concern. Now, you, you, wanna, you should be thinking to yourself, well, Mr. Pento, why do you think inflation is going to be a, a salient issue going forward when it hasn't been in the past? And I'm going to answer that very, very succinctly. Listen, in the Great Recession, the inflation that was created was all trapped inside the canyons of Wall Street because we, all we did was bail out banks. The Federal Reserve printed money, took bad assets off banks' balance sheets, and banks bought stocks and bonds primarily. And didn't make many loans to a, to a consumer that was already saturated in debt. Um, this time around, they're doing something different. They're doing all the same things I just mentioned, but they're also jump through the door the threshold into helicopter money and universal basic income. And in that way, you circumnavigate the banking system. You don't just give money to banks and hope they lend it out to a consumer and a business that doesn't want their money. You're just making direct payments to individuals. So you're not just building base money supply and Fed credit, you're building M1, M2, and M3. That's inflation. You've never done that before. And depending upon the extent and the duration that they have to keep doing that, that is how you're going to get your inflation. And that's what I'm most concerned about. A lot of people, when you talk to them, 
you know, they don't really see the problem with printing money because um, they don't go past that step in their mind. I don't think they understand the impact. You know what I mean? So it's just like, I, I've heard friends of mine say, well, let's just print a bunch for you and me and everybody. Why don't we just print up a bunch of money? But they don't really see the impact of the fact that then people raise their prices because everybody has a lot of money and the price goes higher and higher and higher and higher and who's to stop it. And it's just, it, it implodes that way, which is exactly what happened in Venezuela. It started off great. You know, it was like, oh, free this and free that. And, you know, let's do it. And, <laughs> and so we saw a picture of what could happen to us. We watched a film, basically, of Venezuela. What could take place if we printed our money into worthlessness? And so now I guess the problem is, do we allow everything to fall and fail? Do we allow the airlines and the casinos and, and you know, the funds and the markets and everybody just to crash or do we keep printing money we're in a really bad situation right well you put your finger on the in the crux of the issue so what is inflation so people say it's you know printing money well you know yes it's printing money but what kind of money is it is it printing money and giving banks credit well that doesn't cause massive consumer price inflation we proved that already coming out of the Great Recession. Inflation is about confidence. It's about confidence in the purchasing power of a currency. And you destroy that confidence by printing up a lot of paper dollars and extending credit directly to consumers and businesses. That's how you get inflation. And that's what happened in Venezuela. Now, I, again, I think the inflation is not gonna be hyperinflation like we saw in Weimar Germany in the United States because we're not doing it in isolation. We are the world's reserve currency, um, although that's being attacked and attenuated to a great degree. Uh, you look at the petrodollar is losing its, its grip and Russia and China are getting together to enact trade uh, outside of the dollar. But having a dollar crisis the way that you know, the Venezuelan currency crashed is not really in the cards because, as I said, you're, you're doing this inflation in Europe, and in Japan, and in China, and in England, all over the world. Every central bank is burning their currency. So rather than getting a isolated currency collapse, like you had, say, in Zimbabwe, uh, what you're gonna get is a concurrent spike in inflation like we had in Rome. The Roman Empire had a 1,000% per annum inflation rate. You can get something I don't know if it's gonna be a thousand percent, but certainly double digit inflation. Let's just get, if you can give me that, if we continue this uh, track, and I think we have to in a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of ways, because if we didn't do it, there wouldn't be a solvent public or private pension plan in America. If we didn't expand, if we let everything fail, I mean, the police officers and teachers and firefighters and social security, I mean, nothing would be solvent. The tax base isn't there, Michelle. So they had to do this. I mean, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I wish we'd never gone down this road to begin with, but they, they see they have no choice because, hey, where's the inflation? We got away with it in 2009. Let's see if we can get away with it in 2020. I don't think they are. Because if you get inflation anywhere near double digits, what is that going to do to the, the mortgage market? What is that going to do to the junk bond market? What is that going to do to the corporate bond market? And if you have inflation run intractable, and I think anything above 10% is intractable inflation, then you're going to have a problem when the free market says, I'm out. I'm, I'm selling everything that I have related to fixed income. I'm out. And then the short sellers start to jump on too. And then, like I said, you can't do anything about the only thing, only thing a government can do at that point is say, okay, you know what? We realized our folly. We have to fight double-digit inflation. We're going to stop buying everything. Well, if you stop buying everything and you're the only buyer, let's just take Japan for a quick example. The, the, the Bank of Japan is the only real buyer in Japanese government bonds, JGBs. The only one. And their yield on the 10-year note is negative. So if Japan has to step away from monetizing JGBs, that yield has to go somewhere near normalcy, which is probably close to 10%. Even, 
even with you know even if they don't have a lot of inflation are you going to if there if if the only buyer of japanese government bonds steps away or the only buyer of junk bonds in the united states steps away we can say this argument all over the world what is going to happen to those yields in other words i'm saying yields are going to spike regardless because of the loss of the primary buyer or because of inflation that's the real crash and that's what i'm trying to prepare my clients for right and this is what i want to shift into how are you preparing everyone what are you holding in your portfolio right now and what's the best advice that you can give in this situation so the best advice i can give is you know you cannot be a passive manager you have to engage in active management strategies um, that's that's been proven over and over again i mean if you look at what's happened in in china their market peaked the shanghai peaked in 2007 down 50 percent in in Japan, their market peaked in 1989, down 50%. Michelle, that's nominal terms. That is not in inflation-adjusted terms. 15%. Uh, we have blown up, we, the United States, has blown up your retirement four times since the year 2000. So the NASDAQ collapse, you had the, uh, the uh, uh, real estate collapse, 2018, the fall of 2018, the Russell lost 30% of its value. That was the quantitative tightening collapse. And then you have this crisis. So four times you've lost between 30 and 80% of your money in the last, in, in, you know, in 20 years. So you have to have an actively managed strategy. That's what I do. I model the economy predicated upon 20 components, 10 for inflation deflation component and 10 components for the dynamic of recession and growth. And if you get that right, you can make money when things are good. But most importantly, you can protect your assets during reflationary recessions and depression. Uh, deflationary recessions and depression. That's what I do. And you can also protect your clients from stagflation, which is what I predict is going to come several quarters from now. So right now, you, you ask whether I own Treasury inflation protection bonds, I own gold, I own miners, I own uh, alternative energy, and I own aerospace and defense. Those are the all, and I own. Over 50% in cash, we're having a, you know, I can't quote returns because otherwise you know, it's illegal to quote exact returns. We're having a very good year, put it that way. Uh, and um, the, the, the crux of the matter is I want to have a lot of cash because I do think after the possibility, and, I, and God forbid this could, happen, this could happen, after the market reopens, if they open the economy up, um, then we have a relapse of cases. Okay, so the, 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 the number of cases continues to grow after we reopen the economy. That could happen. Or we re reopen the economy and nobody comes out of their house. I mean, you, the president can open up the economy. Uh, you know, I live here in, in, in New Jersey and Governor Murphy can open up the economy and Governor Cuomo can open up the economy. But if people don't want to send their kids out to school or back to school or go to a restaurant or go to sit in a movie theater, or book a flight, then the economy doesn't really open up. So those two things are, those two conditions are why I wanna have and hold a, an exorbitant amount of cash. So if the market does have this pullback, which I anticipate, we can buy in the panic. Now, when you talk about buy in a panic, are you talking about real estate? Do you think, what, what impact will this have? Will real estate prices go up or down in this situation? I don't see how they can't go down. I mean, I, 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 the traffic is down. I, mean, I think I think the initial mortgage applications were down thirty percent year over year, um, and so I mean I, I can't see how we can't have a little bit of a glitch. Um, but you, you, Michelle, there's a tremendous amount of balance sheet destruction that has gone on. So the you know, the, the the wealth effect has been reversed for the most part. Um, stocks are still down significantly uh, from their all time highs. A tremendous amount of debt has been incurred both on the public and private sectors. Um, so I, I, don't, I, just, I just don't think the money is going to be out there short term to avoid a hit in real estate at this point. I, I, that definitely can change down the road. But you asked me short term, I say how, how the real estate market takes a hit. So there could be an opportunity for investors in real estate after this um, possibly? Yes, yes, yes. So if I'm right about stagflation, Farmland, precious metals, real estate, all great investments for uh, uh, stagflation. Okay, great. So hold your cash until those drop. Correct. 
great. Just wanted to get clear for everyone what you're speaking of. And I also, before you go, I want to get your impression of Bitcoin and what are your thoughts? What have you heard about a global uh, cryptocurrency being put into place, or at least here in the United States? What's going this, on? This is where you, you know, you just open the door for all the hate mail to come. All the <laughs> so I just don't, I mean, I've never gotten Bitcoin. Um, I never liked it. I never will like it. Um, it, it's supposed to be decentralized, anonymous, um, and, and immutable way of transacting money across the world. Uh, the only thing is, is now, you know, governments don't want to have that to be legal because it's know your customer is very important. Anti money law, anti uh, money laundering laws are very important. So what they, they said to the Bitcoin community and cryptocurrency community, Hey, let's regulate this. Well, if I regulate my Bitcoin, right? Then it's no longer anonymous or immutable or decentralized. So what value does it really have? Um, I think it has some value um, in that you can conduct transactions on the dark web and then you can be anonymous and mutable. Mm. Um, and, and, but, but not, that wouldn't be 6,000 per unit of Bitcoin. I think it'd be closer to in, you know, in the hundreds. That's how I feel about it. I mean, if you listen, I get the uniqueness and the 64 bit uh, private key. I understand all of that. Nobody knows my private key. It's unique. You know, it, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers that exist on a private key. So electrons on a, on a hard drive. Um, but you know, you know what else is unique, Michelle? Barcodes are unique. I'm not going to give you $6,000 for a barcode. The only value Bitcoins have and the, and the private and public key uh, uh, blockchain is that it's anonymous. It, it allows me to move money anonymously, but governments don't allow that to happen. They won't allow it to happen. And they can shut it down very easily saying anybody who transacts, uh, 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 makes a transaction over the internet, buying, selling goods with the cryptocurrency is subject to fines or imprisonment. Shut down the exchanges and they shut down e-commerce e legally. Well, who's gonna go out and buy sneakers or, or with a Bitcoin if they can go to jail? They're very easy for governments can, can do that. Now, if you're asking about, forget about Bitcoin for a second, if you're asking about, hey, we're going to need, governments say this, we're gonna to need to make cash have a negative yield to it in the banking system because we really want to get inflation going and get the asset bubble back. Well, what if we make cash uh, deposits have a negative yield, then people ever have a run on the bank. And without deposits, you can't make any, you know, if you take all the money out of the bank, the bank can't make any loans. Mm -hmm. So what do they do? They say we only can make cash electronic and you can't take money out of the bank in that case. You can only spend it. That's what they're going to do. Then you'll have a global cryptocurrency or, you know, a state-owned, state-sanctioned cryptocurrency. That might work. I'm not sure how that helps Bitcoin. Every other cryptocurrency is illegal except for the U.S. Fed coin. How's that? So that's where you think we're going. Yeah. I think I, I think that's where we're going. If indeed they they resort to negative deposit rates in the United States. Yes. And do you think we're headed in that direction? Very possible, yes. Okay. Now, my last question before we go. Gold is taking off. So gold versus silver, Mike, which, <laughs> which is your choice? So it has been my choice for a very long time that gold is far superior to silver. And the reason is because silver, I, I deem it as a semi-precious metal. Um, and it has a tremendous industrial component to it, much more than gold. So gold is pure, real money. Silver has industrial component to it. So silver does a lot better when the global economy is accelerating growth and you have inflation. So that's when silver would outperform gold. But right now you don't have that. You have the opposite of that. So you have a little bit of disinflation at this moment, which is going to be you know, it's, counter, it's going to be counteracted with a tremendous amount of inflation, in my view, in the near future. But you're not having that global growth yet. Maybe in 2021, perhaps, but not now. So gold over silver. Gold over silver. So in a nutshell, though, there are going to be very nice buying opportunities on the other side of this uh, real estate, precious metals, things like that. So hold on to your cash. 
is one mm. thing and you love gold. Well, well, the, well, you said it very well, except the one thing is that, you know, you hear on CNBS, a lot of nibblers are nibbling on this pullback. Uh, you, in order to nibble on the pullback, you had to have a model that's robust enough to tell you to raise some cash ahead of time. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of people did not do that. So if you have a, an active management strategy that actually works, you were able to raise cash ahead of this, and now you have a tremendous amount of cash to deploy, which is what we do. But if you listen to the mainstream financial media who are always 100% or nearly there so long, it's not going to help. That's why they need shows like yours. Michael, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everyone about Pento Portfolio Strategies. Please also mention where to find your book, your podcasts, and where to go to follow your work. Okay, so the website is pentoport.com. The office number here is 732-772-9500. My email address is mpento at pentoport.com. Uh, the book is available on Amazon, The Coming Bond Market Collapse, still very relevant, although outdated because a lot of the figures have gotten a, a lot worse as this bubble has just exploded in size. Um, and if you have around $100,000 of initial investment, you'll get the inflation, deflation, and economic cycle model. And I will personally manage your money, doing very well, thank you. And also, um, if you don't have that kind of uh, those funds available, you can subscribe to my podcast the midweek reality check for $49.99 per year. And it gives you all the data that you won't hear on mainstream financial media and a little bit of analysis to go along with it that could possibly help you navigate this ongoing crisis, which I think is going to only intensify. Wrap that up for us. Yeah, well, like, like I said, the real crash is not the Wuhan virus. The real crash is the inflationary and insolvency, destruction and implosion of the entire global bond market. That's the real crisis. And boy, you want to avoid that. Right. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. You're welcome. It is always great to have you, Mr. Michael Pento, president and founder of Pento Portfolio Strategies. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.